you have fans. No, I think <laughs> they're not here for me. <laughs> From the Commonwealth Club of California, this is Climate One, changing the conversation about America's energy, economy, and environment. I'm Greg Dalton. In 2007, I went to the Arctic on a global warming expedition with scientists and journalists aboard an icebreaker. Experiencing climate change at the top of the world changed my life, and when I returned, I created Climate One as a project here at the Commonwealth Club. For the past 12 years, I've been interviewing leaders about how burning fossil fuels changes all of the systems around us, our food system, our water system, our ecosystems, our lifestyles, and our economy. Climate changes everything. After a decade in the political wilderness, climate is now surging on the national agenda. Politicians who ignored the issue are now talking about it. Elected officials who've been talking about climate are now being pressed to advance more detailed and more ambitious plans. Washington Governor Jay Inslee has been a climate warrior for a long time. In 2007, he spoke at the Commonwealth Club about Apollo's Fire, a book he co-authored calling for an ambitious plan to get off fossil fuels. He's been focused on climate issues since and is now running for President of the United States as the climate candidate. Please welcome Jay Inslee to Climate One at the Commonwealth Club. Welcome back. Yeah. Um, you haven't aged at all. Oh, thank you. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> we last we talked in Paris. Um, happy to have you here today. Um, Washington voters have twice rejected putting a price on carbon pollution uh, <laughs> at the polls. You know, how does that record make your state a national model and you a, a national leader on, cl on climate? Well, what we understand in Washington is the single most important renewable fuel source is the power of perseverance. And we have that in the state of Washington. We also have a sense of creativity and a can-do spirit. So when plan A did not work, which was a carbon pricing system, we went right to plan B, C, D, and E, and F. And I can now tell you that we have passed some of the most comprehensive climate legislation in the last 10 days in the United States of America. I'm happy to tell you we've created this strongest, most aggressive, most enforceable and most environmentally just 100% clean electrical grid law in the United States. And I'm very proud of that achievement. But that is just one of the things we've passed. We've also passed a bill that has created the strongest building code standard so we don't heat and cool our outside. We take care of our actual inside with the first requirement to actually retrofit our commercial buildings. It is the strongest building uh, program in the United States. I'm happy to say we have banned uh, hydrofluorocarbons. I'm happy to say we've created and reinstituted our incentive program to help people finance electric cars. And I'm happy to say we're banning fracking. So I'm proud to tell you that uh, we, have, we have done what Washingtonians do, which is to be very innovative in our policies, and we're making big progress. Now, we are not done, and it is important to realize that. Washington State will have to take some additional steps to meet our targets, and I'm looking forward to the next big tranche. I am very hopeful that the Washington State Supreme Court will make a very wise decision in the next several months and confirm my cap on carbon pollution that I put in place pursuant to our clean air laws. And if you know any Supreme Court justices in Olympia, Washington, uh, you can't say much to them, but you can smile and mention my name. And I'm hopeful, <laughs> hopeful that that will happen. Uh, Beto O'Rourke came out big uh, recently, went to Yosemite, came out with an ambitious uh, climate plan that got a lot of attention. Uh, you know, $5 trillion over 10 years, zero emissions by 2050. Um, you had a tit and tat back for him. So what do you think of Beto's plan? Well, uh, listen, I have been leading on this for, you know, at least a decade and a half. I actually ran for Congress in 1992 and this issue, wrote a book in 2007. I introduced bills in 2003. I joined Jerry Brown in forming the U.S. Climate Alliance and now has 24 states. We formed the U.S. Climate Alliance because we wanted to make sure the rest of the world knew there was intelligence life and intelligent life <laughs> in the United States. And that has been very productive. I've now passed uh, some of the most meaningful climate legislation in American history. I'm very confident that, uh, that I have a unique uh, ability to lead this, this nation. Look, I favor and I appreciate anybody following my leadership. Anybody, anybody. <laughs> and I'm happy that that's now happening. I think it's wonderful that candidates have 
discovered climate change in the last several days. I think that's a, that was a productive thing. And I'm looking forward to debate. I've actually asked the Democratic Party to have the first debate ever during the primary de de devoted to a discussion of climate change. And I think that's very important. So, I'm very uh, confident that, uh, that my leadership is having an impact, and, and I'm looking forward to that discussion. Right, and that, that first debate will be in Miami, which would be a very uh, poignant place uh, for, <laughs> uh, we'll just suggest that, be a very poignant place for, for that debate. Um, Beto O'Rourke also recently signed, in the last couple of days since he announced his plan, signed the No Fossil Fuel Pledge. He also said he's not going to take PAC money. You have a, 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 one of the few uh, super PACs operating uh, the act now on climate change. So your view on PAC money and, and fossil fuel money in the campaign? Well, first off, my view is that we have to have a candidate who is willing to stand up to the oil and gas industry, number one. And that's why from day one I said I'm not taking oil and gas or coal money. And I'm a, candidate who did that. I didn't need any convincing, unlike the other candidate you just mentioned. And the reason is, is that we have to break the back of the ability of this industry to hold us shackled to, to fossil fuels. We have to have a candidate who's willing to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with this industry, who has not taken a half million dollars from them, who hasn't voted for an off to, to allow offshore oil drilling, and is willing to fight to say that we should take away that $27 billion of taxpayer subsidy money yeah. and take that money and put it in clean energy. Yeah. Well, I'm a candidate who's willing to do that. So, so I've uh, taken a quite a strong stance in this regard, and, uh, uh, and I'm not going to gonna speak ill of any group that's working uh, to defeat climate change. This has to be everybody uh, pulling on the rope at the same time, and that's where I come down on this. Barack Obama ran on hope and change, mm -hmm. and writing on and it, you know fear of climate change. You, know, you think this is a winning message, talking about something that a lot of people think are scare, is scary, and they don't want to think about. Well, let's be clear. Uh, those of us who believe it is American destiny to lead a clean energy revolution and defeat climate change are not the fearful people and are not the pessimistic people. Donald Trump is the insecure, fearful person who is too pessimistic to understand the innovative capabilities of Americans to create a new clean energy economy. And we are doing that right today in this state. I visited several businesses and talked to business and working people in the last two days in California, looking at the development of electric cars. I, I, I talked to folks who did one of the largest solar panel installations in the country in Nevada last week. I've talked to the people who are installing wind turbines in Iowa and solar panels. I had to argue with Megan McCain on The View a few weeks ago, and she said, you pesky Democrats are going to take away our planes and our trains and our automobiles. And I said, well, that's fine. Because this morning, I have a shiny blue General Motors all-electric bolt charging in the governor's driveway, made by American auto workers in Orion, Michigan. That's the vision statement that we believe in, because we are the optimists, we are the people who are determined, and we are the people that understand that this is a can-do nation full of can-do people, and they deserve a can-do president. And I'm up to that task, so that's where I come down on this issue. The Green New Deal has really changed the national conversation on climate. I had here a couple days ago, sitting in that chair, Carlos Curbelo, former Republican member of Congress who did a lot on bipartisan with climate. He said, I don't agree with the New Deal, the Green New Deal, but it has started a conversation yeah. and opened it up. Yeah. Barney Frank, longtime liberal member of Congress from Massachusetts, said it's a loser in 2020 because they tried to do too much too fast. Your thoughts on the Green New Deal? Well, I think it has been a real positive development for the national discussion for three reasons. Number one, it's got people talking about it, right? This is a thing that had, what, four minutes of debate in the last three presidential races. So anything that will get this even on the debate stage, even to provoke uh, the Barney Frank, that's a good thing to wake up Barney, so that's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> I love Barney Frank, by the way. Um, uh, Second, it has raised the ambition of the scope of what is necessary here. Look, this is a huge mobilization of the United States to build a clean energy economy, and I think it has raised people's ambitions level. 
And three, and importantly, it has brought more people into the discussion. So we know who the first victims are of climate change. It's usually people living in poverty. It's the poor who are living next to the freeways, breathing diesel smoke, and as a result, having their kids having an epidemic of asthma. And so bringing in communities of color and those who have been the victims in indigenous communities, it has succeeded in this regard. Now, what we have to realize, though, is that uh, we have to develop a suite of concrete, specific, tried proposals and policies that we know will work where the rubber meets the road. And so we have to design the rocket, not just say we're going to the moon. So tomorrow I will introduce my, roll out the first tranche of my clean energy proposals that will give us 100% clean electricity and a transportation sector that is clean and a building sector that does what we're doing in our state, which will be very concrete and specific proposals. And this is where I think I come in because of my uh, experience for you know over a decade and a half designing these policies. So that's what all of us have to do now is design those policies to make sure we got to build the rocket now, not just say we got to go to the moon, and that's what the work we'll be doing. Would you like to give us a few of those details here today? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, <laughs> 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 I'm, you hate to step on your own message, but uh, I think that what I can tell you, because I do want to shave a couple surprises for tomorrow, uh, is that the kind of thing that we've done in Washington is the kind of thing that I believe is a template for success in Washington State. And I believe my experience as an executive, my successful experience in the most successful state economically in the United States, can serve as a model which we, we can do in the United States. So we ought to believe that we can have 100% clean electricity. That ought to be uh, something that we can tell Americans that, that they can have because I have told Washington, Washingtonians they can have. And so tomorrow I will talk about that and how to achieve that goal. We have to have a way to decarbonize our transportation system. We know that it's possible driving electric cars. I drove a hydrogen fuel cell car the other day around the, the capital uh, quadrant. And how to do that is something I will talk about tomorrow. We know that we need to or want to save literally billions of dollars on our heating and cooling costs. So we need to improve the efficiency of our buildings. I'll talk about a way to do that tomorrow. And my approach will be unique for several reasons. Number one, it will be multi-sectoral. I will address each one of these sectors with a specific proposal on how to deal with that specific proposal. Number two, it will be based uh, on a real life scenario where we have really looked at the possibilities in each sector. Number three, it will be based on successes that we have had in my state. This is not unicorns and rainbows. It is based on successes that we can show that I've actually delivered. You know, rhetoric's one thing, reality is another, and I'm able to, to deliver. Number four, we will have somebody who believes in concrete ideas, not just airy, uh, dreamlike uh, trans states. And we will actually put concrete policies proposal. And, and, and last, and I think frankly the most important thing in this, is to elect the president with a personal, uh, compelling, passionate commitment to this mission statement. And I, I can tell you why I got into this race. I love being governor. Uh, I've been very successful. We've done some very successful things in my state. Uh, things look rosy for me, but bottom line, I, I just decided that I wanted on my deathbed uh, to be able to look at my grandchildren and tell them I did every single thing I could to prevent climate change from destroying their future. And that includes running for President of the United States. That's a personal, compelling, compassionate uh, position I have taken. It is motivational for me. Uh, I heard somebody say, I will, I will be committed to this on day one. Look, you've got to be committed to defeating climate change every single day in the next president's administration. I will organize the entire federal government around this principle, and I will bring the political capital necessary to get this job done. Look, you know, everybody's got a to-do list, right, on your refrigerator. This cannot be just on the next president's to-do list. Because if it's not job one, it won't get done. I would be your president to get this job done because I'll make it job one. 
and I'll, I'll think about it every single morning when I'm shaving, and that's a commitment to you. To, to get in that position to do that on day one, you first need to defeat Donald Trump. You're speaking very pragmatically, rational, and, 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 and then there's this alternate universe that is our political reality today where, where details and reason seem not to have currency. How do, you, how do you bridge those worlds and take him on? Well, number one, I feel very confident about this, going toe-to-toe -to -toe with him, uh, because you know I know he, know it, he likes nicknames, right? But the only thing he's going to call me is Mr. President. So I'll be happy about that. And, uh, and I've already, I, I do feel confident about um, uh, my confrontation with him because I've already had a confrontation with him. I have sued him 21 times and I have beat him 21 times in a row. It started when I was the first governor to stand up against the Muslim ban. I'm the first governor to say we should admit Syrian refugees. Uh, refugees. I'm one of the first that have stood up against his inhumane, uh, literally torture of young people, separating them from their parents. I'm very adept at that. But I've also had a personal confrontation with him. Um, I was at the White House last February for the National Governors Association. And when you're there, you get all these governors being sweet-talking the, the president and I had a different approach uh, <laughs> because he wanted his, this was after the shootings and the school shootings, and his approach was, let's just give first graders Glock pistols to wear in their hips and that'll be fine. And I just stood up and looked him in the eye and uh, told him how ridiculous that idea was and how dangerous that idea was and how much educators thought that was a, a ludicrous idea. And he crossed his arm and he stuck out his lip and sits there. When he's insecure, he kind of rocks back and forth. Have you ever noticed that? And he got that kind of pout. And I finished by saying, Mr. President, you know what? You need to tweet less and listen to educators more. And in that moment, I felt I cannot wait to be on the stage with Donald Trump. <laughs> so well, there's also uh, some, some tension and conflict in, in your own uh, party. You know, Alexander Ocasio-Cortez is championing the New Deal. We're here in Nancy Pelosi's district. She seems to be trying to tame it, perhaps contain it. Uh, and there's, you know, talk to us about the progressive wing who wants to go further, faster to the left in your party, and the establishment who's saying, slow down, let's not go too far to the left. Well, I would suggest creative tension can be healthy, and there's nothing wrong with that in a Democratic family. I think a Democratic family is going to be united to make Donald Trump a blip in history, and I'm very confident of that at the end of the day when we hit the starting gate. I would suggest, uh, because sometimes people want to wrap themselves around ideological uh, debates about spectrum, I would suggest here's where we need to be in America starting in 2021. We need to be where Washington State is right now. Because Washington State has been listed as the best place to do business by CNBC and the best place to be an employee by Oxfam. We have the most rapid wage growth and GDP growth in the nation. And the reason we have been able to do this is we have developed what I call a middle out strategy of economic development instead of a trickle down strategy. We have been dedicated to growing a middle class and caring for working families and recognize diversity as a strength. So if I can, really quickly tell you what I think should be the American uh, 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 vision statement. It should be to have Washington State's best in the nation paid family leave so you can care for your family when there's a need. It should be, it should have be Washington's best in the nation highest minimum wage. It should be the first net neutrality law passed in the United States that I passed last year. So we can protect the internet. We have a radical notion in our state that women should get paid the same as men. Now, I know that's radical, but I'm happy to tell you we have passed the most strongest gender pay equity law in the United States. I've heard other people talk about what would be a good idea to get educators' uh, pay increase. I'm happy to tell you this year I got an average 12% pay increase for hardworking educators so we can keep them in the classroom. I'm happy to tell you that we are. We are, we are bringing uh, a criminal justice reform because of the racial disparity that has been so pernicious in our, in our justice system. That's why I'm the first governor to offer thousands of pardons for those who've had marijuana convictions. 
We're ending the death penalty. We've had a template for a police violence uh, law so we can reduce violence between police officers and communities of color. So we have a template for success in Washington State that uh, I don't think you have to worry putting on an ideological spectrum. We just need to put it on a geographic spectrum, which if you want to see the future of America, look west of the state of Washington, and I'm up to that job. So that's where I am. So uh, Republicans have Ronald Reagan, Richard Nixon from the West. Democrats have never nominated a, a Westerner. Are you geographically challenged? <laughs> Uh, no, I've just never run for president before. <laughs> <laughs> Jackson tried, right? Right? Jackson tried. I, I, you know, it is an interesting question. Is this more of a just a historical irony, or are there reasons for this? I don't spend my time worrying about that. I'm just going around the country talking about a positive vision for our nation. And I think, as I've indicated, um, we have proof in the pudding. We have actual results, not ephemeral ideas of what, we, what I'd like to do in the future, because I've done it in my past. And I think that has salience. When I go to the Midwest, look, we won seven seats. We flipped from red to blue this year in governor's races while I was chair of the Democratic Governors Association. And the reason we succeeded is that we were able to talk to communities, for instance, in Wisconsin, Michigan, Minnesota, Illinois, and Kansas. Those of us who uh, are, are play on this team have been concerned maybe we couldn't compete in the Midwest. I showed that we can compete in the Midwest by flipping five governor seats this year. And the reason is, is because we have stayed true to our value system of a woman's right of choice, respecting diversity as strength, viewing everyone as a particularly treasured <coughs> member, of our, member of our community, and at the same time, speaking to those people who have had economic insecurity in their lives, who might have voted for President Obama and did not vote for our candidate in 2016. Those people we got back in 2018 because we have a message of economic growth and clean energy is central to that effort. So I'm very confident in our ability to win in the Midwest from the far west. Uh, we ought to be doing that. In 2012, you campaigned uh, pledging to veto new taxes. 2014, facing a big budget deficit, you introduced new capital gains tax on high income earners, taxes on cigarettes and oil refineries. What would you do on taxes? Well, first off, as we discussed, I would bring a bit of fairness to our tax code, which will reel in the $27 billion that are now being pilfered out of taxpayers' pockets and give to the oil and gas industry. I will stop the, the advanced uh, uh, efforts of the coal and fossil fuel interests to take, to take fossil fuels off of our public lands, which our assets are now essentially killing us over time because of climate change. Mm -hmm. I believe the Trump tax cuts were wrong. They blew up the deficit. They give the huge uh, bulk of our, uh, everything to the top X percent, and they need to be largely repealed. <coughs> Then we have to look at the progressivity of our tax system in general, and I believe we need a more progressive tax system. And here's the way I believe this. Look, climate change is an existential threat, and I believe it is the most urgent because we only have one chance to defeat it. Th this is our last chance. But the explosive income inequality and concomitant homelessness and problems of, of of intergenerational poverty is also an existential crisis in the United States. And I believe tax policy is one of the things we have to use to end that intergenerational poverty, to end that enormous inequality. And this is a problem that we have. Trump keeps talking about how wonderful his economy is, but the fact is people on the lower half of the income scale have not had a raise for 20 years. You can't say it's a great economy when half the people in the country are working hard and not getting a raise effort. We have to have a suite of policies, including a public option in health care, and I'm happy I'm the first governor ever to uh, pass a public option for health care. I'm the first governor that's created a long-term care program that will provide long-term care for those of us who will be lucky enough to be senior citizens. We've done the best minimum wage. And by the way, don't let anybody tell you that raising the minimum wage 
will destroy your jobs. You know who's got the highest minimum wage in the United States and the most, right, most rapid job creation? It's Washington State. And we had to persist in these efforts. Do you ever worry that by doing all those things, more Californians will move up to Washington? <laughs> We, uh, I live on a little island uh, in Puget Sound called Bainbridge Island. And uh, if any of your neighbors have moved to Washington, they're probably my neighbors right now on Bainbridge Island. Uh, our, our states share a lot, um, and they share some of the finest traditions of America. I know California is kind of a punching bag sometime with late night comedians. But when you do think of the qualities that have defined our nation, California and Washington continues those traditions, one of which is a tradition of openness, of allowing people to come in and build a whole new economy. You know, the companies I've talked to in the last uh, few days, um, I was at Zooks the other day, they're building an autonomous electric vehicle, and they had the, the group of people, they were seating, sitting on bleachers when I met him, met them, and it looked like the world, right? It looked like the world sitting in those bleachers that have come to California to build a whole new clean energy economy. And one of the geniuses of America, maybe the best genius, uh, is the fact that we have been willing to bring in tremendous talent from around the world. And now we have a president who wants to staunch that flow. This has been the lifeblood of creative genius in the United States. It needs to continue. And no, Mr. President, we are not full. We are eager for talent. When we built the Statue, of the Statue of Liberty, it had a purpose, and that purpose is still alive, and I fundamentally believe that. Our guest today at Climate One from the Commonwealth Club is Jay Inslee, Governor of Washington and Democratic candidate for president. I'm Greg Dalton. We're going to go to our lightning round, which I know the governor <laughs> always appreciates. Um, True or false, uh, Governor Inslee, growing domestic oil production is good because it means America is less reliant on foreign oil. Big false. <laughs> True or false, climate change will hurt your liberal friends in their lifetimes more than they realize. Uh, true, that's true for everybody. Don't pick on my friends. <laughs> uh, They're precious right now. Uh, True or false, realizing the depth and magnitude of the climate crisis has moved you to tears. You know, interesting question. Uh, I've cried a few times in my life. <laughs> I'm thinking of my dad right now. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure I've cried about climate change, but I have been very emotionally impacted when I'm down on the beach with my grandkids. My dad was a biology teacher, and he uh, would take me down to the beach, and he would show me the little critters, and I can remember just being fascinated by them. My mom and dad worked on the uh, slopes of Mount Rainier, revegetating the alpine meadows, uh, and my mom's most favorite flowers in the alpine meadows and the slopes of Mount Rainier. And it is deeply troubling to me when I look at my three grandkids and I realize that their grandkids or, or their kids may not be able to enjoy all of the joys that I have had. And fundamentally, this is about humans. It's about our joy. It's about how we enjoy heaven forests to hike in and places to ski and clams to dig and fish to catch and clean water and, dare I say it, air to breathe. This is a human issue. By the way, everybody talks about planetary crisis. The planet Earth is going to be fine. It's humans that are in trouble. Okay? <laughs> and so we have to understand, and so it is very emotionally compelling to me. And again, this comes back why I think I am uniquely qualified for this job, because I think I've embraced this for several decades. And what I've learned is when you have a hard job, you better get somebody who's up to it to do that hard job. To, to build the mobilization to defeat climate change that we have to build that is of a scale and scope uh, of what we had to do to defeat fascism, we better have somebody with a deep conviction. And my grandkids give it to me every time I see them. Thank you, Governor. Um, true or false, you have thought about when, you, when to sell your oceanfront home because rising seas will diminish its value. You, you say I have an oceanfront home? What is that? <laughs> <laughs> your, your favorite, not, 
<laughs> no, I'm not dangerous that way. Well, well, I live high enough for probably good for maybe half a generation anyway. <laughs> uh, look, this is a real issue, right? So we are, are there places now on our coastlines where there's going to become questions in the near future whether you can get insurance for your home? Uh, I was with the mayor of Miami Beach uh, a few months ago where they've had to build up their road, their main street, a uh, foot and a half, two feet. So when you shop now in Miami Beach, you look down at the, at the shopping windows. It's, it's the darndest thing. You walk down into, into the, the shops. We've had to design one of our water treatment plants in Anacortes, Washington. It's, it's designed like a giant floating boat so that when we have sea level rise and concomitant floating, the whole water treatment plant will effectively float. And the reason I point these things out are this is not something in the distant future. This is today. It is affecting it. The guy who sat next to me on the flight coming down here had a home in Westport, Washington. And he said in the last 10 years, he has lost 100 feet of shoreline. So now he's only like 60 feet from the Pacific Ocean. And he sold his place uh, last year because he realized what the future looked like. So this is a real term uh, uh, issue, but thanks for caring about my home. <laughs> uh, true or false, it's scandalous that Amazon paid zero federal income taxes in 2018 on $11 billion in profits. We're doing something about that. We've done some new uh, revenue positions in our state, which is going to have some of these businesses paying a, a fair share to help finance education and mental health care reform and also saving our orcas because we need to save our orcas. And I'm proud that I've got bills uh, to do that and a way to pay for it. I'd like to mention a, a noun. You just mentioned the first thing that comes to your mind when I mention carbon capture and sequestration. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind may surprise you because it's uh, topsoil in Iowa. Because there is a distinct possibility that we can use topsoil to sequester carbon at the same time we are reducing erosion from our agricultural lands, which is obviously a challenge. And when you mention carbon sequestration, most people immediately think of cap carbon capture from coal plants and the effort to bury it, which has not worked uh, anyway economically. But I do think there are possibilities to even generate streams of revenue for the agricultural community for practices that allow plants to take carbon dioxide out of the air and put it into the topsoil, and trees to put it into wood fiber to get it out of the atmosphere. I think those are things we should think about. What comes to mind when I mention the American Petroleum Institute? <laughs> well, this is a publicly broadcast. Uh, <laughs> look, the people, the people, I think it's important to say, the people who work in these industries, great people, hardworking people, we should embrace them and help them through this transition. We're going to have a transition in this period to a decarbonized economy. There are two things we have to do, not one thing, but two things we have to do in that transition. Uh, one, we have to break the, the bondage of, of the federal government to the fossil fuel industry. And that's where guys like me come in who are willing to fight that bondage politically. Um, it's also why we have to get rid of the filibuster so we can finally pass climate change legislation in the US Senate. That is absolutely a predicate to success. But the other thing we have to do is to make sure we embrace the families that have worked in some of these, these older technologies in the fossil fuel industry, like we've done in my coal-fired plant. Did we talk about this yet? I, I've been in so many interviews. Let me give you an example. So we have, uh, we're closing our last coal-fired plant in Centralia, Washington. But we have made sure that we had a transition plan for the families who have worked there, sometimes for generations, in that community. We've created a $55 million fund to help those families in job training and education and ways to build small businesses and ways to help their local com community for infrastructure. Because these are good Americans, we need to respect them and care for them and help them through this transition. That's a just transition. What comes, uh, <laughs> what's the first thing that comes to mind when you hear William Barr? <laughs> <laughs> Gone. <laughs> Last 
one, what's the first thing that comes to mind when you hear the name Steph Curry? <laughs> um, it's a tie between awe, I played a lot of basketball one day, and, and naked envy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's give a round to the government for that. Transition. You've been traveling the country. You've seen people affected by wildfires, the right. ravage of the West, yeah. floods. When those things happen, people who don't have insurance, people who have less the least amount of financial resources to bounce back. Yeah. What should the government do? Because I interviewed uh, Governor Christine Todd Whitman once. She said, Uncle Sam cannot continue to be writing $60 billion checks yeah. after these disasters. What's well, the first thing we need to do is stop forest fires from raging and destroying us, which means we got to stop climate change. That's the first job of government. But we do need to help these communities. We're going to have to, just from a community standpoint. Uh, I visited both Paradise, California, and I drove through at night, 25,000 people. And it was like a post-apocalypse Hollywood movie. I went to Seminole Springs and talked to people with mobile homes, and the people with mobile homes usually are sort of uninsured, and they lost everything in these communities. So it's just heartbreaking. Uh, I was in Hamburg, Iowa a few weeks ago, a town that was founded in 1858. It had never been flooded before, and now it was under five, six, seven feet of water, and, and about half of it destroyed. So I know firsthand the pain of climate change, and I've seen it throughout the United, United States. I do believe that we have to focus, while we're going through this effort to defeat climate change, to focus on the first victims, which are, as I've talked about, frequently people in poverty, frequently people in communities of color, indigenous communities. We need to help them with their utility bills. For instance, in my 100% uh, clean electrical grid, we have a provision to help lower income people with their utility bills. We want to focus our infrastructure spending uh, with the victimized uh, communities first. And if we play our cards right, we will have a more just country at the same time that we have a healthier country, and I think we're capable of doing that. What have you accomplished working with Republicans? <laughs> more than you would imagine, actually. Uh, we have passed the largest transportation infrastructure package. We have $70 billion of transportation infrastructure, and I did that with the Republican Senate. You know, they can't build a birdhouse so far in D.C. Uh, we've also put in the largest uh, educational package, about $6 billion, and I did that on a bipartisan basis while there was a Republican Senate. And it takes work, and it takes a lot of patience, and uh, it, but if you bring those tasks, and if you're a good listener, you you know at least in my state, we've been able to do some really really good bipartisan things. And uh, I would hope that I could bring some of those skills to Washington D.C. That doesn't mean it's going to be all hugs and kisses, but uh, I think I bring those skills to bear. We haven't heard a lot in this uh, presidential season yet about commander in chief. What would you do as commander in chief and establish America's place in the world? Uh, first, I would start with the precept, very different than the current uh, occupant of the White House, and that is to believe that alliances make us stronger rather than weaker. <laughs> Number two, I would uh, uh, look at the, the, through the lens that when America has made foreign policy mistakes, it has been most frequently when we have believed that we could restructure other cultures and other communities when that was well beyond our ability to do that. And that is why I believe now we should bring our troops home from Afghanistan. We should look at the mission in Afghanistan as sort of threat containment rather than nation building. And uh, I felt the same thing when I was one of the most vocal opponents of the Iraq war. I think I, you have to make independent judgments, and I've been very forceful in doing so. Number three, I think we ought to have a president who actually listens to the intelligence officials and reads your briefing before you go on and, start, and, start, and, and make decisions based on long-term tactical thinking rather than the need for a press conference. And unfortunately, that's what's going on in the White House right now. And the last thing I will mention is, I think we need someone who is willing to stand up for their convictions 
even though the winds are blowing against them. Uh, that was certainly true in the Iraq War. It was true in 1994 where I represented a very Republican area in Yakima, Washington, a rural, small town agricultural community. And we only had a couple more votes we needed to pass the assault weapon bill. And I knew that if I voted for the assault weapon bill, I'd most likely lose my seat. I did provide that vote. I did lose my seat, and ever since, I have not regretted that vote for one heartbeat because it was the right decision. And I'm pleased to tell you we have the NRA in the run in Washington right now, and we're passing gun safety legislation as we should. That's the What's your relationship with Howard Schultz, and what kind of citizen was he in Seattle? You know, I never say anything adverse about any of my constituents, of course. But I'll make an exception. <laughs> uh, actually, I, I, I have very little uh, relationship with Mr. Schultz. Uh, he sort of views himself on a different plane. And so, uh, I, you know, I really don't know him very well. I think it would be very unwise for him to throw his hat in the ring because the only possible consequence would be to give Donald Trump a possibility of election. So I hope he does not make that decision. And he has been a very successful business pe a person, obviously. He's put a lot of, giving people a lot of employment. And I really would not like to see his legacy with this asterisk that he reelected Donald Trump. So, uh, you know, he's very innovative. He's very creative. He invented the $4 cup of coffee. That took a lot of innovation. Uh, but I hope, he, I hope he stays with his business uh, occupation. And I also hope he starts voting. <laughs> You are a lawyer, career politician, and a white male in a party that wants, seems to want a candidate who is not those things. So what's, what's your point? What's your point? <laughs> <laughs> what's the path for you when in, in a party that wants someone really left, but maybe different? Well, uh, listen, we got a lot of talent in the pool. There's a lot of talented people, and I am confident we're going to get a good nominee. I'm confident we're going to be united. I'm going to support that nom nominee unequivocally. I know there's a lot of talent in the pool. There's at least 19 people that would be good vice presidents that I've identified. So that's <laughs> uh, but I will give you a serious answer because I think it is a serious question. So uh, we know that we have real challenges uh, continuing to advance the arc of the moral universe in our country. We know that we still live in the shadow of racial disparities that continue to bedevil us and gender uh, inequality and people who still are unwilling to accept uh, people for who they are and who they love. And we have a lot more, so much more work to do in this regard. And I approach this issue with uh, a lot of humility because I have never experienced that in my own life. I've never been a black teenager pulled over by an officer in a white neighborhood. I've never, I've never been a black teenager followed around a store because they didn't trust me. I've never been a woman who's been talked over you know, in a meeting. Uh, I've never been a member of the LGBT community who's had epithets thrown at me on the sidewalk. So because I've never experienced that personally, I really believe that I have to dedicate myself doubly or triply to the mission statement of being a leader to help people to do away with the implicit bias and our prejudices and our fears to lead our community along that arc of the moral universe. And, I think, and I've done this. I'll just give you some examples. Uh, I've, I've made sure that the people who work in my leadership cadre have implicit bias training so that they can be aware of their own biases that are sort of in all of us. I've made sure that in my hiring that we, we have the most diverse workforce I think we've ever had that pretty much per perfectly uh, mirrors our community and that's been a very intentional act. I've looked for ways to bring more justice and less racial disparity in our criminal justice system. It's, one of the reasons we are, have now done several things like decreasing juvenile kids, a lot of people who are a community of, of color ended up in the criminal justice system. We're trying to keep people out of the criminal justice system. We're trying to end this racial 
disparity uh, in that dis system. And I'm proud that uh, two days ago, three days ago, we had a measure that uh, affirmative action was banned in my state quite a number of years ago. And it has resulted in inadequate opportunities for a lot of people in my state. And it has bedeviled us. And we had a citizen's initiative to the legislature to restore affirmative action in our state. And it was all right on the cusp of whether or not the legislature was going to pass it. And my and my team helped the legislators find the courage to pass it. I'm proud to say we have now restored affirmative action in my state. And the guy who cast the pivotal vote on this was a guy from kind of a relatively conservative area of my state. He gave courage to other legislators, and I, make him, I made him Washingtonian of the day. <laughs> That's the kind of spirit that I will bring to this job, and I feel up to this job. <laughs> Let's go to our audience questions for Governor Inslee. Welcome to Climate One. Thank you. I'm Peter Boyer, a longtime Climate One supporter. Uh, thank you, Governor Inslee. We've been admonished to restrict ourselves only to questions, so I'm going to disguise my statement with <laughs> and simply ask you this. Is it true that the best way for anyone in this room or in any room to ensure that the issue you're championing is heard on the debate stage is to become a supporter of your campaign <laughs> at any level from $10 and up? <laughs> and anybody can do it. Is that true? <laughs> That is a, a most brilliant question. I've ever had. <laughs> it shows great insight. <laughs> the only thing you left out is it's jayinsley.com. So. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. I appreciate anybody that does want this to be on the debate stage, and we have to get 65,000 people to make sure it is. So you all have a First Amendment right to help make sure that climate change is on the debate stage in June, and jamesley.com will help exercise your First Amendment rights. <laughs> Welcome to Climate One. Thank you. Uh, hi, um, my name is Elise. I'm with Citizens Climate Lobby. Thank you so much for running, Governor Inslee. You've got my support and my vote. Um, so my, I'm curious. I know that it's been very difficult to pass carbon pricing in your state, and uh, many economists believe, both on the left and the right, that that would be the most important thing that we can do in terms of fighting climate change. And, Right now, there's a bipartisan bill with 32 sponsors, including my, my uh, Congressman Barbara Lee and other local congresspeople who support this bill, the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. And I'd like to know your position on carbon pricing have, with, with your experience <coughs> and whether or not you would sign that bill into law once it passes through the Congress. Well, I think uh, uh, a revenue-neutral carbon pricing system should be one of the options that are, that are uh, open for consideration. Uh, and, but I think we should not get into a dead end of thinking carbon pricing is the only way to solve this problem. Because it might be the most difficult political way to solve this problem. And it might be, even assuming the economists are right, it's much better to get a suboptimal thing to get something done than hang in for, there for something you can't pass that's the optimal provision. So it's one of the reasons I've embraced this multi-sectoral approach that I'll be rolling out tomorrow. <coughs> with rules of the road, with regulatory approaches that we know that work, both in the utility, transportation, and building sector, that do not involve a direct price, but do move the needle dramatically from a regulatory standpoint. I mean, there's two ways to get investment and behavior, right? One is a, a price signal, and the other is a regulation that makes a legal requirement. A legal requirement's not all that bad. <laughs> And so that's the provision that we are engaged with right now. But as time goes on, I believe all of these possible things should be on the table. And we, please thank Barbara Lee for me. She's great. <laughs> we have 15 minutes left. Let's get through as many questions quickly as we can. Next one, welcome to Climate One. Thank you, Gil French from Critical Path Capital. Governor, thank you for what you've done in Washington State and what you're proposing to do in Washington, D.C. Uh, beyond the immediate actions that you've described uh, so well, uh, we're going to have to transform the infrastructure of this country. Uh, roads and bridges, buildings, retrofitting of or replacement of building stock, transforming the way that millions of American businesses do business. 
uh, aside from a price on carbon, how do we do that? I mean, perhaps it's hinted at in what you're going to announce tomorrow. But how do we how do we drive that transformation? Well, I, I, one of the things when we say infrastructure, I think one of the important things to note is that traditionally, we, when we said the word infrastructure, we immediately think of bridges and highways, right? That's been sort of our idea about infrastructure. I think now we have to expand that by a factor of three, because infrastructure now has to include our utility systems, our water systems that are on the verge of collapse, our transmission systems of water. And uh, we have to think of infrastructure much more broadly. The third aspect of that is we have to think of infrastructure as, as a critical part of the climate change plan. I will not actually roll out that part of my plan tomorrow. We're going to do it in tranches, so we have to wait a few days or a couple weeks to get that. But we have to find a way to do that that is the most uh, uh, well-targeted and reasonable way to get the biggest bang for our buck. I'll just mention some of the things we know we need. We need better transmission systems to be able to wheel renewable energy from where the sun shines and the wind blows to where we're using that electrical distribution or that electrical energy. We know we have to have massive expansions of our, of our electrical storage capacity because we do need to maximize the utility of renewable intermittent energy systems. This is why I've been so committed to R&D to improve the capacity of that. And one of the shining uh, examples of things that's worked in my state is we've had a clean energy development fund that has spun off some companies that are now doing really good battery storage. But then we have to wait, have to, wait to finance it and allow utilities and other companies actually uh, to finance it. Then the granddaddy of, of the grandmother of them all, which is our building infrastructure, which is going to require very significant investment in, in that infrastructure from a variety of sources. But I would point out when we do this, and it's important on infrastructure when we talk about this, one of the challenges I have found in the clean energy discussion is a lot of people think of it, well, that's just for the physicists and the computer scientists and you know, the people who design solar cells. No, 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 no. This is for carpenters, teamsters, IBW members, plumbers, sheet metal workers. These are the folks who are going to be rebuilding our infrastructure. And that is why this is so accessible as a job creation engine in the United States. So stay tuned. If you can wait a few, a couple weeks, we'll be having a specific discussion about this. Next, welcome for Governor Lindsley at Climate One. Um, when I've asked my friends to support you, a lot of them have expressed concern that you're being framed as a single-issue candidate and that Democrats don't tend to support single-issue candidates. How do you balance prioritizing climate and making clear to primary voters that you can lead on other issues as well? Well, uh, by telling them the truth, and that's pretty easy. Uh, and there's two truths in that. Number one, climate change is not one issue, it is all the issues. It is an economic issue to prevent the economic disaster that's going to befall us. But the projections are, in later decades this century, the economic losses we will experience from an inaction uh, path will be, could be double the last recession. You know, do you know how painful the last recession was? You ain't seen nothing yet. Because climate change could cause multiples of the last recession and economic dislocation. It is a health issue. Uh, I talked to a couple in New Hampshire uh, a few weeks ago whose daughter missed two years in college because she had Lyme disease because the ticks are moving north. It is a national security issue because of mass migration that the Pentagon has told us is going to happen because of drought that will precipitate political instability. And the Pentagon's hair is on fire on this issue. We're seeing uh, climate change refugees right now from Guatemala today. So this is not a single issue, it is all the issues. And in order to solve these other issues, we have to solve climate change. That's number one. The second truth is, and I've talked with you a little bit about that, look, I'm going to go out on a limb here, uh, try to exercise as much humility as I possibly can, and tell you that I'm the most successful executive person who's running for president of the United States with the incredible achievements of the state of Washington it should be a model for the United <coughs> States. And the best thing that can happen in the United States for people of the other 49 states 
to get the wins I've got for them, and I can do that job if you give me this job. So that's what I thought. Governors have a lot better track record uh, than, than senators running for this office. Let's go to our next uh, question. Governor Inslee, my name is Julian Moore. I'm with Climate Careers, and we're an employment platform for uh, startups and nonprofits working exclusively on climate change solutions. Uh, so I really appreciate more trying to get people to work for these companies, of course, and get, get uh, work on the solutions you talked about. So I appreciate your focus on the new economy. Uh, my question is how do you think federal policy can address the uh, iron rule? of climate policy, which is that essentially that people are willing to pay more uh, for climate-friendly uh, goods, services, whatever, but only to a point, you know, with the evidence being, of course, with the uh, Yellow Jacket protests in France and elsewhere. Well, uh, one, of the, one of the things is, uh, look, the, the kind of things that I have proposed in Washington do not have direct costs uh, to consumers or taxpayers just like they did not have costs when we required catalytic converters in our cars. And those of you, when I was in your age, or as well as I can see you anyway, uh, we could not see Mount Rainier from the campus of the University of Washington because of the smog. Literally, you couldn't see it at all. Then uh, the federal government required catalytic converters. And when we did that, the auto industry said, we'll never have cars again. You will destroy the economy as we know it. This is a communist plot to destroy uh, the capitalist economy. And guess what? They invented catalytic converters, and now we've been able to see this beautiful Mount Rainier because of a federal policy that did not direct any particular cost that anybody could identify until our forest fires started to burn down. And we know forest fires are going to double because of climate change. And for the last two summers, you couldn't see Mount Rainier in August. Literally. And we had to close our swimming pools because the air quality was so bad for our kids. So what I would say is I believe that this will be good for the economic prospects of Americans. And the reason is, is if you think, if you think fighting climate change will cost you something, look how much it's going to cost you if we don't fight climate change. It's going to cost you through the nose. And it's like fixing the roof on your house. That is an investment that costs you a lot less than your, than your roof caving in and, and, uh, and your two by fours rotting. That's just a reality. So I feel very confident in this, and we're going to put massive people to work <coughs> while we're doing it. We've done it before. And for people who say, oh no, we just, we're not capable of mass reindustrialization of, the, of, of America. I looked at this number, and I hope I've got it right. In 1939, we made 3,000 airplanes in the United States. In the next four years, we made 93,000. That's what we're capable of doing, and we need to do it again, and we're going to put a lot of people to work when we do it. Next question. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Governor Inslee. David Kuhnhart. I'm also a fellow volunteer with Citizens Climate Lobby, and thank you especially for bringing the let's say, the, the potential great economic success that we can have innovating in the face of this. Um, I have a recommendation for you dealing with Greg's first question. He, he tried to nab you in his first question with, hey, twice in Washington uh, you lost on a carbon tax. And I would this is what I would recommend that you answer this time forward. <laughs> I am running in part so we can take this message of a carbon tax, which puts a price on the problem and shares the benefits with everybody increasing the economy at the national level with a border adjustment. At the state level, you can't have a border adjustment. Constitutionally, you can't okay, do that. Thank you. But you, you can at the national level. Got a line behind you. Thank you. Thank you. Christopher Phillip, I'm with the Climate Institute in Washington, DC. And Oregon is blessed with really strong ocean currents. And the Department of Energy says there's 500 gigawatts of gigawatts. A gigawatt is roughly a coal plant, you know, 500 gigawatts of uh, marine hydrokinetics available. So, what so the question is, uh, with the previous thinking administration, uh, they said we're going to take Ernest Moniz and Stephen Chu and make them the secretaries of energy, guys with Nobel Prizes and doctorates. Do you have a plan for your energy component for actually creating the renewable energy like marine hydrokinetics? And if so, could you tell me who it is? <laughs> I, think, I think you sponsored a bill on that one. Uh, yes, I've actually uh, worked to try to <clears throat> uh, deal with some of our permitting issues. 
to look at marine uh, hydropower. And uh, there's made some progress in this technology. It is very challenging because the ocean environment is unbelievably hostile. But I'm open to these ideas and also open the idea to help work through some of the permitting necessary uh, to allow that to advance to get a good technology. We're also very interested off our coastlines of offshore wind. We have enormous offshore wind capabilities, but we have to figure out a way, because our, our seashore is very steep, to have floating caissons to, to anchor the foundation of the wind turbines. And we have research going on in that. And by the way, one of the things we haven't really talked about is we need to increase our federal R&D uh, by so many factors. Uh, because you know we spent more money designing one kind of Jeep a few years ago than the entire research uh, budget for clean energy in the United States. That has to change. Uh, we're not going to go to the moon on the cheap, and I'm committed to that. Next question, welcome. Hi, my name is Liz. It's nice to meet you. Um, I'm very interested in climate. I'm very inspired by the fact that you brought it to the forefront and that you're advocating for climate as an issue that, frankly, it's like the granddaddy of all issues. It really encompasses everything. But I'm also just curious about you as a person. It's not that often I get to talk to a presidential candidate. And I'm, I'm curious as to what has been the best part about running for president, personally, professionally, anything that you've managed to accomplish so far, or any hopes and dreams that you may have that you've been enjoying throughout the campaign. Yeah, well, it has been uh, really invigorating because I, you know, we've gone through such a hard time with such fear and anxiety and divisiveness that the president is engaged in. And people have been so troubled, rightfully so, by his uh, abusive behavior. But what I have found in talking to people is that I have found a group of people who are trying to pick the, the nominee of the Democratic Party, who are very engaged, very uh, energetic, very committed, very desirous of being unified, very open-minded to ideas, and very judgmental, uh, really making sure candidates show what they're about, not accepting just you know bumper sticker kind of slogans, but really drilling down to really see who's got the chops and, and who doesn't. And this has been actually very inspiring to me. So that's been the best part, is just talking to people from all the states I've been to, and, and, and I wish more people could hear how, how positive people are about this experience coming up. Now, from my perspective, that's a good thing, because I'm a, a, an underdog, right? I don't start with the national name ID. I start with President Carter and Clinton started at, you know, 1%. And so I've been an underdog my entire life. I won in a very Republican district in 1988. I went to Congress in 1990 in a very Republican district. I beat a Republican incumbent in a swing district in 1998. and 2012, I beat a guy who started 16 points ahead of me. So I'm just where I'm always as a great underdog with a great attitude. So uh, this has been the best part about it. Last question, welcome. Hi, I'm Dan Rink, a political futurist. I'm absolutely delighted in this presentation. It's been more educational than almost anything that I've seen. How can we make sure that the, the primary debates in the Democratic Party, plus the presidential debates, are informative and instructive rather than just personal smackdowns? Just uh, make sure I'm on the debate stage. Uh, important. Uh, listen, everybody does, if you share my view that we need a debate on climate change, I can't remember if we talked about this or not, but I've advocated having a debate singularly focused on climate change issues in the Democratic Party. I think it will be helpful for us. And if you share that view, you can share it with the National Party. That's one way uh, to do it. Governor Zay, I'd like to thank you for your passion and leadership on this issue. It's pretty clear that it's sincere, and you are influencing the debate just by raising this issue. So let us give a round of applause. the governor of Washington and Democratic candidate for president. Podcasts of this and other Climate One shows are available wherever you podcast. Please leave us a rating. Thanks for joining us next time. We'll see you next time, everybody.